Hello, marhaba, and welcome to our third World Kid Live event and our first panel in a new series, each one of which will focus on a different country or language. This first one is about Arabic literature, which you can find in many different countries, of course. Uh, the two earlier panels we are now on YouTube if you want to go look at them. And this panel will also be archived on YouTube in case you miss part of it or want to go back and watch the whole thing over again. So today I am will be joined by four different brilliant and award-winning panelists who have worked in all different areas with regards to Arabic literature for young readers. Um, and I'm also joined by Mohini Gupta, who makes everything happen in the background, and Ruth Ahmed Zaykemp, who is uh, looking for your questions on the Facebook Live event right now. Any, at any point that you have a question, um, you don't need to hold it back or try to keep it in mind. You can go ahead and type it in straight away, and Ruth will get uh, bring those questions together and in the last 20 minutes of this panel event, uh, feed them these questions to us. So thank you all so much for coming today. Um, and I'm gonna introduce the panelists sort of one by one, and then they will talk a bit about their work with uh, Arabic literature for young readers. We're gonna start with Suzanne Abouheda, who is a brilliant academic doing very important research into Arabic young adult literature. She's also worked with IBI, the International Board on Books for Young People, with organizing prizes and reviewing children's literature. And actually, I'm just gonna let Suzanne tell you about herself. Unmuting myself. So first of all, thank you for putting this all together. Um, I just want to talk very briefly about my sort of work experience because before I was an academic and a researcher, Fatmas joined us. Um, I, like Marsha said, I used to work on the practical side of things. So I got my start working on, uh, it was a project funded by the Swedish government. It was managed by the Annalind Foundation, which is based in Alexandria, Egypt. But we worked in, well, we were supposed to work in five uh, countries, but by the time I joined up, the conflict that started in Syria. So that include, involved, you know, uh, you know, organizing prizes, um, exhibitions, workshops, doing research, and it was really a very good induction into Arabic literature. I mean, I did know a bit about it from school, but you're in a place where the books are coming to you and you're working directly with publishers and sometimes being on the receiving end <laughs> because you're working with prizes and book selection on the receiving end of their anger and uh, you know drama. Um, uh, and that's not a, that I understand that's not a very usual situation because I do feel that Arabic literature, good Arabic literature for children is sort of um, the best kept secret. So unless you're in that sort of uh, situation where you have the chance to meet people, the books are coming to you, you don't necessarily need to buy everything, you go to book fairs, it's hard to really understand how much good literature is out there. So that was my start. Um, I learned a lot from that. And then I worked with IBI, which organizes the Slot Award. I was kind of tangentially in involved with that, but we also had uh, workshops for authors and illustrators. We worked with the Goethe Institute to do a, a project called Made in the Emirates. So to sort of work on homegrown talent, if you will, even though other activities weren't necessarily just limited to, uh, to the Emiratis. And also because the Emirates has two major book fairs that are good places to go if you want books from all different Arab countries. And book fairs are really important as we're finding out in this COVID era where we feel like, you know, we don't have a sense of direction because we're not able to see the books. Um, and then after that, I did my master's. Uh, almost all my assignments were on Arabic books. I did it in London at the University of Rockhampton. Of course, I needed to have the books with me because, you know, good luck finding Arabic books in the UK or you don't get much of a variety. Um, my master's was on picture books and the adult child power dynamic. And that's sort of an interest I've retained. And now, well, I've just finished my PhD that was on young adult literature and it involved looking at the books for sure and two books by two authors on this panel. <laughs> so one book by uh, Cappuccino by Fatima and Lughz uh, Al-Sakr by Tagrit, which I think should be translated for sure. I really love, I really love that book. Um, we're doing work with uh, readers because we don't have tons of reader response research. So Hadil's research in that area is also really important. 
Um, and just to mention sort of two things I've done on the side so that I don't take up too much time. One of them is um, an online magazine I started with, uh, with two friends, Hala, who's a common friend with Fatima. I mean, it's been, which is sort of like doing book reviews and interviews with people and also uh, different articles. That's been inactive for a while because we've just gotten really busy, but maybe one day we will sort of <laughs> revive that. And finally, another project that I did with my supervisor who has a connection with Egypt, we took some books, which ha we happen to have at hand. So one of them was uh, Lama Osha by Fatima. I love that book. Another one was Takshira by Nasiba Uzzaibi, illustrated by Hatim Ali. Um, another one was by Amal Farah, which is Muthalath um, Wada'ira, Walid Tahir's The Black Dot, and um, Matil Chev, uh, Kanas, the street sweeper. So we took those books, we went into Scottish schools. In one school, nobody spoke a word of Arabic, yet when we tried those books, they got the story. Like the only issue we had was with the black dot, it's a bit too long. But other than that, and that's the ultimate test of a picture book, that the illustrations really do a very good role of telling the story. So uh, that was, and we've published a bit about that. I think Fatima has a copy of that article. And I think that's it. <laughs> that's all the time I'll take. Thank you so much, Suzanne. That's a fantastic introduction to many different things. And I would just say for any publishers who are watching, these two books that Suzanne talks about having done research with for her a PhD thesis, exactly. the Mystery of the Falcon's Eye and Fatima's Cappuccino. If you're interested in a sample, please email worldkidlit at gmail.com. Next up is Hadil Ghanim, who is the winner of this year's Best Book Prize from the Atisalat Award for Arabic Children's Literature. And I believe also translation rights may still be available. <laughs> um, she's also written YA, picture books for young readers, and I learned from her website recently, was the translator of the Geronimo Stilton se se series into Arabic. Thank you, Hadil. You're on mute. Thank you, Marsha. Uh, it's great to be with you guys, all of you. Um, um, this is a great panel. I've always wanted to meet uh, all of you. Um, so uh, yeah, my work with uh, Arabic children's literature has always been me trying to mix my hobby into my serious work uh, and gradually making this kind of pleasure or secret hobby into legitimate work. So. Um, I always loved folk tales, for example, and uh, early on while I was working in a serious magazine and posing as a serious grown-up, I was saying, folk tales are so important, it's cultural identity, we should be gathering them and doing stuff. And, and also uh, when I did my master's degree, I kind of um, smuggled in my dissertation to be about Mickey Mouse magazine and how we, are, how we were consuming it in Egypt, sort of localized it, Egyptianized it, the experience itself. Um, but then after that, I, um, I did have my chance of actually entering the field and being introduced to the professional side of children's book uh, publishing and production. Um, in about when I worked for Daughter Shuru as an editor for about two years. And it was during that boom, during that, um, I, I remember the um, Anna Lind Foundation um, um, research or a project and uh, we had our own little boom in Egypt uh, in the industry so in a matter of two years I did travel to the um, book fairs like Bologna and also uh, locally um, it was a chance to edit many books translate um, and even author so and it was a fun thing I found out that actually I enjoy storifying for children I enjoy simplifying, you know, I, I like the challenge of bringing a difficult event, a difficult feeling, a difficult idea, and making it clear and simple and a story, fun. So um, it's a challenge to me, and I think it, um, personally, uh, this is what I like to read. This is how I like to read, even when I, even if it's science, history, anything, if it's told in a nice story, if I like it. and. Um, and of course, engaging children is one of the most um, difficult things, and it's 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 challenging. When you do, it feels good. 
Um, so, um, yeah, um, I did, I, I, for example, I enjoyed storifying uh, Nagi Mahfouz's biography, an author that I love. Uh, so uh, that was one of the very first things I worked, uh, about, uh, worked on. Um, later I didn't, I, I found myself in uh, realistic fiction with A Year in Inna, which actually made me, me and my protagonist, protagonist we actually got into a lot of, um, in, in the countryside, in southern Egypt, I, um, I found myself dealing with a lot of issues of discrimination and difficult issues, but it was really a wonderful journey. And I, um, and I was like, um, I did a lot of research in, with anthropological texts and all that. And, um, and that's how I, my, my next project is actually the book that you see right now that just won the prize this year, but I worked on it right after a year in Inna because I wanted a break from realistic fiction and I really wanted to go into a uh, fantasy world and magic and just go out there. And, um, and it was fun. It was another challenge. I loved playing with the, uh, this monstrous <laughs> text uh, um, and with all the monsters and I tried to make it a little uh, kinder. <laughs> it was um, kinder to women, kinder to kids, make it available and accessible to kids because um, and just play with it. Um, so yeah, um, I'm looking forward to doing more. Um, I think the attention from the award will probably um, help me with collaborations that I've always been looking forward to. Uh, graphic novels, mysteries, uh, again, using those uh, collaborations. Sometimes I have still friends who work on, um, because their work is maybe uh, takes them to interesting places because of their anthropological work or ethnographies or histories that they're working on, I keep saying, hey, this is so interesting. Let's do this. Why don't we bring this to children? So this is the kind of uh, thing that I like. I still, I'm, I'm not bored of folk tales. I'm not bored of classics. I still want to do more of that. And so, yeah, here we go. Thank you so much, Hadil. Um, next, I want to introduce Tahrid Najar, a pioneering and award-winning publisher and author who has written books for children from ages one to 101. You can read a number of her books in English translation, although sadly not yet any of her YA novels. Please, worldkidlit at gmail.com for samples. But The Hul uh, was recently chosen by Tahrid, which is in translation from Interlinked Books, was recently chosen as one of the Chicago Public Library's best of the best of the year 2020. Tahrid, it's you. Thank you. Thank you, Marsha. And I'm really very glad to be with all of you here. And uh, thank you for organizing this uh, webinar. Uh, well, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Where do I start now? <laughs> I've been writing for uh, children now for over 40 years. So it's really been a very long and bumpy ride but uh, kind of fun also. Uh, I always feel that I'm very lucky to be in this profession, to be a writer, and uh, I enjoy what I'm doing, and uh, uh, it's really a passion that I have. But when I started, I started in the 70s. So my, my you know, uh, journey into writing is also like the history of what happened with Arabic literature in the, in the Arab world. When I started everything, you know, in, in Jordan, uh, there was no established publishing industry. So, I mean, especially for children books, maybe there were a few publishers otherwise. And uh, uh, after I graduated, I felt I, uh, this was my dream to become a writer and write children's books, Arabic children's books. So in the area, uh, the, there were two publishing houses that stood out. One was Dar al Fat al Arabi, a Palestinian publishing house in Beirut. And another was the Iraqi uh, publishing house um, associated with the Ministry of Culture. So uh, I was really trying uh, my, you know, myself out as a writer, to think of myself as a writer. And I sent my text to Dar al Fat al Arabi. And when they, they accepted three of my texts, I was over the moon. And uh, suddenly, 
it became a reality, you know, my dream of becoming a writer. So there, there it was, the feeling that I could do it and I can be a writer. And uh, I, you know, from that point on, you know, I was really um, stuck with, uh, with this idea and uh, took it on. Uh, but of course, as you all know, in our Arab world, uh, slowly in the 70s, uh, the civil war in Lebanon and then in Iraq uh, war and all that. So these two projects also were at risk uh, at that time. And uh, in Jordan, I wanted to try something in Jordan, but that was also uh, very hard because, as I said, uh, there were no illustrators that you could go to. There were no uh, printing presses, even uh, color printing presses were very new at that time. And no designers, nothing to, to really uh, use and become a writer. Uh, but uh, I managed to publish one book. My first book that I did was with a, a project. And uh, that also helped me a lot because uh, since I couldn't find an illustrator, I illustrated the book myself. It was called Safan al <laughs> And uh, I realized also that it wasn't enough to publish a book and print it. You have to sell it. And there was the whole process. So I was uh, almost selling the book one by one uh, to each person <laughs> on, on their own. Uh, but after that, after a few years, um, I uh, started teaching. And I chose to teach the age group that I was writing to. And I enjoyed that part. I taught for the five years. And it was with a school that was very understanding and cooperative. And, you know, uh, I was teaching first grade. And I wanted, uh, they didn't have material, reading material. So I said, wow, this is an opportunity. Here, I want to be a writer. And here are children who want books. <laughs> so I started writing. Uh, books for the, my school, uh, my classmates, the, the children in my class. And I decided to use, like every month, I would uh, write a story and give to them, but uh, I would choose one of the students to be the protagonist. And uh, I, I illustrated the books, uh, coloring book style, and then uh, there were stencil machines then, so it stenciled the stories and uh, give each child a story to color and read. And uh, that really gave me a lot of feedback from the kids and from the parents and encouraged me to try harder to find a publisher. So uh, I looked for a publisher and finally I convinced, uh, arm twisted almost, uh, one publisher <laughs> to try and publish the books. And the agreement was uh, as such, you know, I would uh, give him the book, but he, he wasn't an illustrate, you know, a publisher of children's books. So um, he said, to publish your book, I have to get the book to him illustrated. And of course, I have to pay for the illustrations. I have to find an editor. I have to do everything and just give him the book ready for print. I was very happy to do that because I had finally found a publisher uh, to do it. And then after that, uh, my dues were 10% uh, of the print run. So uh, in my case, it was like 200 uh, books where I also had to sell, and uh, this is how I got my dues. But this was really, I, had to, I have to thank this publisher because he taught me how to become a publisher. And after a few books of that, uh, I uh, founded my own publishing house. And I'm telling you all this story because people ask, uh, I, sometimes they don't understand how come you're a writer and a publisher, why is that? And that is why. <laughs> so, I established a several publishing house I founded, and uh, this is the story of uh, a several publishing house. And the books that I wrote with the students have become classics in our publishing house. We publish them as the Best Friends series. There are 12 of them, and uh, they're still very popular with kids now. Uh, at that point, you know, uh, things began, began to get better. A lot of people in our area started getting interested in children's books. And many publishers, illustrators started happening. Of course, technology also helped, like now we're all from different countries. So you could really get an illustrator from another country. You don't have to, uh, you know, to travel there or see the, the illustrator from another country. And that helped a bit. But the focus mainly was on picture books. 
and nobody was coming near the young adult books for the reason that it was difficult economically and also nobody knew what to do with the children's books. Too many taboos of what you should do and what you should say and what you shouldn't write in children's book. So nobody wanted to go near there. But finally, uh, I think uh, Samah Dries in Lebanon was the one who broke the, the, the mold. You know, he was the first one to write Al Malja. And I think he inspired a lot of uh, writers to do the same. He wrote a young adult uh, novel about, uh, you know, uh, the civil war in Lebanon, something real, something that happened and, and meant a lot to, to young adults. And uh, I think after that, uh, the ball started rolling and people started experimenting. Fatma uh, followed with uh, Fatin, uh, a really lovely book uh, about that. At that time, uh, I, was, I was still thinking that my niche was picture books. But then one day, uh, I wanted to write a book about uh, cancer, and it started as a picture book. But then I decided, I saw that it needed a lot more, and I decided to take the step and write uh, a longer book, like a novella. And I did that with a lot of trepidation. You know, I was afraid I wouldn't uh, be able to <coughs> be successful at that. But thankfully, uh, the book was very well received and was even shortlisted for uh, an award. And that gave me the courage to continue. And now I have like, uh, here I have a more near <laughs> stack of my novels. <laughs> and funnily enough, uh, you know, all of them were shortlisted and one of them actually last year won the Salat Award. So what I'm saying that uh, you should all try something new sometimes, not, not be afraid uh, uh, not to try. And uh, I think that's all. I uh, hope we can talk about the problems uh, with young adult uh, literature and uh, the taboos and uh, categorization. We have lots of uh, subjects to talk about. Thank you. Thanks, Tahrid. So finally, the, the great Fatima Sharafeddin coming to us from Beirut, one of the most celebrated, award-winning, and prolific authors of Arabic children's literature, written more than 130 books, translated to more than 12 languages, including English. And yeah, I loved, I remember when Fatim came out, and I, I remember how much I loved that book. And Fatima. Don't forget to, ah. Yes, yes. Uh, hello, nice to see everybody here and uh, welcome to every other person who is listening to us and we don't see them. Uh, uh, I'm the opposite of Tahrid. I started um, as a teacher uh, and then um, I did my master's in early childhood education, uh, focused on children's literature, not knowing I will ever write for children. It was not an in my mind and then uh, I did a master's in modern Arabic literature and the two um, degrees together led to something that I had never thought about so I worked a lot with children I taught Arabic a lot uh, many many years in the US and then um, uh, my kids were growing and I was looking for good books for them to read and that was uh, late 90s so I wouldn't find real good books that would be equivalent to um, the books I read to them in the US um, um, and later on in Europe. Uh, so I decided to do something about it. Um, first, I thought it was a conscious decision, but uh, when I started, I realized that that is the only way I can, I can express myself with. So I found my path, if you want, by chance. And it was like if you had um, shaken a bottle of, uh, let's say, Pepsi, and then you, uh, it, it, it poured. And that's why um, I think um, I'm very productive since I started. Um, of course, the, the, the course of writing, I started about 15 to 16 years ago. And I'm running, you know, I'm not stopping. And I have uh, uh, taught myself a lot. I uh, took a lot of workshops in the beginning. 
um, and then I decided to play with the language, like um, uh, uh, you were saying. Um, uh, uh, Arabic language is, a, is an elastic language. I think it's a very um, athletic language. Uh, so I wanted uh, to address the children uh, with uh, a playful language. I didn't want to use the classical Arabic that we read as children and that the books that existed in the market at the time were written with and they were translated more than there were, you know, um, uh, genuine uh, Arabic uh, writing. So I wanted to do something about the language. I think that's what I think um, um, made the children like my books and the publishers, of course, because I was reaching out uh, not only to the needs and uh, likes of the children, but also to um, uh, getting to them, uh, you know, uh, with the language that they liked and they understood. So I start, I wrote um, a lot uh, through the years. Uh, um, first, I started writing for ages three to six, and then I thought, okay, we don't have baby books originally written in Arabic. I did that. And then, okay, after six, seven, we don't have, you know, a lot of literature. So I moved up, up until I'm working, uh, I'm writing novels now for young adults. Um, I did some biographies um, like the, uh, the Ibn Sina, Ibn Battuta, Ibn Rashid series. Um, I did poetry books. I did the rhyming books. Um, uh, and most of my books are dealing with social psychological issues, I think. I mean, of course, there are lots of silly books just for fun, but also um, I, especially my young adult books, I always, I can't write fantasy or science, you know, science fiction, or I really want to deal with real issues that kids are, are, are facing these days. Um, so this is um, in general, <laughs> and now maybe we can, um, you know, talk about more issues dealing with language and taboos and all of these things. <laughs> Okay, I just want to, because everybody has mentioned these very different paths into, I, I asked everybody to share qu their questions with us, and we're going to start out uh, uh, with questions from each other to each other. And Suzanne had a question saying that there is there is not a great deal for of support for new writers and illustrators and independent publishers, although they do continue to emerge in Arab countries. So you know, from a process of trial and error. And the question is, how, how, how can newcomers be supported? Or do you have advice for, for people who are just entering? And Fatima, I'm going to throw the question right back at you. Don't forget to unmute, though. Yes, sorry. Uh, well, how to support newcomers? Um, that's basically uh, what I have been doing in the past few years. I travel around before the Corona times, travel around the Arab countries to uh, give workshops, different kinds of workshops uh, uh, for grown-ups, you know, for, for young uh, people who want to uh, write for children. Um, I think we have a gap in the Arab countries where we don't have a specialization in universities uh, about creative writing for young people, uh, let alone illustration. You know, there is one uh, university in Lebanon, uh, Suzanne, correct me if I'm wrong, the ALBA that gives one course in illustration. So we don't even have um, that. Um, uh, available for the new uh, illustrators to focus, you know, to know the, the rules and uh, about illustrating for children. Uh, so I think um, for now, the best way is to attend workshops and uh, there are some, I'm sure there are some available workshops online now. I give uh, workshops online uh, for anybody. Now I'm doing it with, uh, with uh, schools children in Dubai, actually. Um, so there's always uh, a way. And I always tell newcomers to read um, a lot in all the languages. They know all kinds of books, good or bad, or 
um, so that they form their own uh, opinion about um, the right way of, you know, for them to go in their path. Thank you so much. So uh, another question from Suzanne that I think does get at some of these um, taboo issues as well as other things was how well uh, Arabic children's books travel from one Arab country to another and whether there's a fear of the content being too local or, um, or not a good fit from a book written in Palestine to be sold in the Emirates or a book written in Lebanon to be sold in Morocco and Tagrid, um, how do you how do how do how do books travel between Arab Arab countries? Mm -hmm. I don't think this is very much of a problem. Uh, but let's talk about books for different ages. I mean, uh, books for as picture books, they probably uh, there isn't much difference. Uh, in different countries, even different Arab countries, or even uh, outside, you know, the Arab language. Uh, young adults also, I think that's it's important. They're different, but in my opinion, uh, they are accepted everywhere because uh, the children now and young adults are open to what is happening in all parts of the world. They're also open to that in Arab countries. And... Uh, I tried that with some of my novels when I went to Tunis and uh, you know discussed uh, one of my novels with them. Uh, I didn't find that there was any kind of difficulty uh, in understanding because of the local. And anyway, uh, this is what it's all about. We're talking about diversity, diversity uh, of books in different languages. So let's talk about diversity of uh, uh, Arabic books in different uh, regions. So uh, an Egyptian book should be very accessible to a Lebanese or to a Jordanian or a Palestinian. Great, thank you so much. Now, of course, if anybody else wants to jump in on any question, go ahead. Um, Hadil has her mouth open. Go ahead and <laughs> Well, since I have the shortest career, uh, I can talk about supporting, how can you support um, writers and illustrators and this industry? And um, because I've been living in the US for the past few years or several years, um, I really find uh, something like a, an association, like the Association for um, Children's Writers and Illustrators. They have, it's a nonprofit, an NGO, uh, some, it's not a union, but it, it, the, the idea of having an association is, is really wonderful. And they have it in every, they have chapters in every locality, uh, states, cities, and people who are interested, they gather themselves, they um, either in a coffee shop or in a library. But because it is not very centralized, I mean, I don't have to go to a fancy city with a fancy ticket and, you know, and, um, and of course there's membership. So that's how you can have a pool of, of money. And we can have those workshops on different scales. It doesn't have to be in the biggest book fair in the Arab world. It could be just a small part in my small city and get to see who's interested and learn from each other. Um, so if we can have that, I think this would be, this would be great. And honestly, I also want to hear from, uh, mostly we talk to each other, writers, illustrators, publishers in those fairs or panels. But what I really miss is the input from teachers, from, uh, from librarians. Tell me how my, my book is, is working. Uh, does it work or does it not work? How do kids, because I don't have access to, for example, public schools in Egypt, which no one has access to. I can only visit a private school. So I could learn from maybe Tavrid's um, background in teaching, or maybe she has better access in her country going into schools. So these kinds of things could, I mean, I wish our conversation is kind of uh, continuous and um, so maybe having an association somewhere with a website where we have these uh, one place to go to and build on past conversations and past experiences because there are a lot of people working but sort of in islands, you know, they're not very connected and there are universities and there are people, you know, um, teaching and working and but we just don't know and we keep um talking about the same issues again and again as if you know they're being talked about for the first time so 
That's my two cents. So Suzanne, actually, then I want to, so Hadil is talking about how books are received in classrooms, teachers and librarians, and some of your research was sort of really intensively looking at how two books were being read by some teenagers in Lebanon. Are there lessons from that that authors can take? Um, I think the primary lesson is, I mean, what I found from my experience is you can't always count on the teachers or the schools knowing. So from what I know from how publishers sell their books, a lot of them have people who go from school to school, you know, talking directly with Arabic language coordinators and teachers. And I'm, and I was, it'd be nicer if, if some of it was happening the other way where people are, I mean, it's happening to some extent, but I think we need more of that. Um, in terms, and also it, the way, I mean, this is, based on my own experience when I was studying Arabic literature back in school, which is like more than 20 years ago, uh, where it's about, you know, there's one proper interpretation for something. Even like, I remember once we were reading a short story by Lebanese author Marun Abud, which we could have easily read by ourselves, but the teacher had to sort of go and explain everything, even though it was completely accessible. And we need to sort of get a new way of dealing with literature where, rather than the teacher talking all the time, explaining or giving one interpretation where we open it up for them expressing their own opinions, which I think they really enjoyed expressing their own opinions. They also like working together in collaborative ways. So I think there's, a, there's some work to be done with teachers for sure. Um, and I, I mean, they, and this school actually had a like, school library, which was already kind of impressive. Uh, but um, I don't think they had any young adult in it. They had some uh, classic Arabic, which is also, I mean, it's also wonderful. That could definitely be somebody's path. We're not sort of posing, you know, young adult as to save us from all this boring literature, because that's not really the case. There's a lot of, you know, great literature for adults that they can enjoy as well. Yep. Thank you so much. So um, uh, I had a question from Hadil, uh, and she had asked, um, what makes a book a good candidate for translation? Uh, sometimes there are very good and successful books in Arabic that just don't well, work well in another language. And uh, is any book translatable or how, what, and especially for, for children, what makes a book work in translation? I'm going to aim this at Fatima. Yes. Uh, from my experience, I have noticed that the West wants books that are related to our culture to our history and not any fun book that we write because, well, they think their market is saturated with the best books. Uh, so at least with my experience with the Grandwood uh, books in Canada, uh, they translated uh, um, Ibn Battuta, Ibn Sina and uh, Fatin. Uh, and all three, uh, especially Ibn Battuta and Ibn Sina, uh, you know, are historical figures from the Arab Islamic uh, heritage. And that's what they're interested in. Uh, same, uh, in uh, same thing in Turkey. Uh, they, um, well, they were more open in Turkey and they translated uh, a series of a little boy that I wrote uh, with uh, Kelimat, uh, three or four books. Uh, in school, at the hospital, and uh, and uh, when I went there and I toured the, the schools in Turkey, the publisher who translated them told me this is the first time that we have we finally can translate uh, cultural values that fit our values. So uh, that was with Turkey, which was an exception, but in the West, in in Belgium. In, uh, in Canada and in other languages. Um, I think the West wants to uh, um, reinforce the stereotype they have from our cultures. I don't know if Suzanne has another opinion, but <laughs> this is so far my view. Yeah, I can just butt in a bit because um, um, my supervisor, she gives a course called Text for Diversity and I give a particular session on Arabic literature, but sort of like Arabic literature, that's available in English. So I give them uh, two lists of recommended books. One of them, I think, uh, for teenagers, one of them for picture books. And I'm like, this means that these are books either translated into English or written to begin with in English. Are there common themes? And there are common themes, of course. Family, war, a lot of interest in girlhood. And I think they do kind of feed into stereotypes about, uh, you know, 
about the East and the Arab world. There is, there is some truth, to it, quite a lot of truth to that. But we can try to change that <laughs> and interest them in more fun, exciting books. Um, I'm going to, because we have a lot of questions, I'm going to move to the questions, but we can continue to ask each other questions as time goes on. Yasmin is, ask, is saying hello to everyone. And she's asking, what would you write about if there were no boundaries? And what would you do with an unlimited grant? Yasmin has some unlimited money there at AUC, apparently. Um, Tahrid, what about you? What would you there write about if there were no boundaries? And what would you do if you had an unlimited grant? You had a billion dollars. Oh my God, what a question, Yasmin. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, if I could write about anything, I don't know if I would change that. I think I have boundaries, I, I have my own boundaries. Uh, it's not that uh, the boundaries, but they have uh, boundaries and society's boundaries. So I will not go wild if I have no boundaries at all. I think I stick to my to what I think is right and not right, and how much. And because when I'm writing, I'm also uh, thinking with the society, with the, with the reader, my reader, and uh, I have to be sensitive to to how my reader receives the the message that I'm sending or the story. So uh, yes, mean I'm afraid I will not go. Uh, you know, use that. Uh, out of, but I'm, I'm sure uh, I will relax it a lot more about a lot of subjects. So a lot of the taboos that I don't believe in personally, I will, uh, you know, uh, cross them. Uh, but other than that, uh, it will be contained, but uh, uh, much more free. Uh, as for the, the money, the budget, I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh, somebody asks you if you have a million dollars, what would you do? Uh, I think uh, we publish a lot more books and uh, try to make them accessible to much, you know, many, many, many more people who can't afford these books. So that's what I would do with them. What about you, Hadil? What would you do? You would fill your books with curse words or no, if there's no boundaries at all. And you have, Miss Mean is giving out unlimited money, I heard. Okay, well, I, I had a dream like years ago, and it was like, I want to travel and collect fol folk tales, just go from village to village and maybe bring my friends and we just go and collect folk tales, listen to oral folk tales, and then come back and write them and compare them. So I've always had that um, fantasy. Um, maybe now we don't need it as much. I don't know if we, if the world needs it, but I thought it would be fun. Um, and of course, I um, there's just so hundreds of classics that I want to just revisit and play with, and have teens bring maybe classics into graphic novels and all that. Um, so yeah, I, I would like that. And actually, one more thing about boundaries. Yeah, I think uh, I would love to write a love story for young adults and see what happens. I mean, um, yeah, we need more. We need, we need to talk more to talk about and not be afraid. Um, uh, Fatima, you can answer that, and then I'm gonna. But I'm also gonna throw in another question from uh, Hatim Fati Ali so that we get to a bunch of questions. And he wants to know, so where do people go to find good workshops to join? Uh, who to, what to follow, what to look for? Um, how, how do people know other than stumbling on a, a link that somebody shared on Facebook? Um, unfortunately, all the workshops are organized by private uh, institutions, organizations, uh, uh, mainly in, uh, in, where I go is in Saudi and the United Arab Emirates and they're not open to I mean you have to be there physically so if you live in uh, in Morocco uh, you have to travel on your own expenses to uh, Dubai let's say to take the workshop that's why um, uh, I am uh, uh, encouraging people who give workshops to start uh, doing it online 
Um, I have a friend who is going to help me to develop a course online. So that's my my dream now is uh, is to to do that. And that course would be like a like a big workshop. You know, it will include uh, lots of information about the field of uh, children's uh, literature. Um, yeah. Can I just butt in here for a second? Um, I, I mean, thank you for the question, Hatem. I think it's a really important question. And what would be ideal, you know, with all this pot of money, and this is something that Yasmin and I have been discussing, which is rather than just having one-shot workshops, what are sort of more long-term ways of supporting authors and illustrators? It could be, you know, a one-year course, it could be a mentorship program, and we're sort of talking about our history, like for example, we talk about all the illustrators affiliated with Dar al-Fat al-Arabi and the enormous influence they had in sort of developing this new visual language. And they did it because it was a group of them and they did it because they had a mentor, which is, you know, same because this is something that Matil Shavd and Smail Neshef has spoken about. And also with what was happening in Iraq, there was a government will and a government structure. And we, I think we do need something with this pot of money <laughs> that he has been distributing where we can have something a bit more long-term where it's not just about doing workshops sometimes with non-Arab uh, trainers because they don't speak our language. They don't understand our visual heritage. So the individual author and illustrator has to make a lot of effort to sort of inject this. And we do have the sort of mentorship links. We need something, we need those. We don't really have them at the moment or they're happening very much, you know, one-on-one -on -one and we need something more sustainable. Okay, I have two questions two people who are asking kind of a similar question that I'm gonna shoot right back at Suzanne, which is um, they're asking why isn't there YA in Arabic? Now I would say, well, I'm hoping that Suzanne will say, what are you talking about? It's discoverability that's the problem, not the lack of YA. Uh, sorry, I have to agree with you that there is some YA. Um, there could be a lot more of it. And I think one reason we feel there isn't a lot of it because it's being published in different countries. So, um, and one issue is definitely distribution. And I think in the end, I'm a materialist and coming from a cultural studies approach, it is, you know, it's the market stupid, which means that they're having trouble selling these books and publishers, this is, uh, Shirin Traidi did her PhD on marketing Lebanese books. And she's also talking, sharing her experience as a publisher. Publishers do worry about selling these books because they're not so well integrated in the curriculum, even though that's, you know, double-edged sword, this integration in the curriculum. And young people are not necessarily buying these books. They might be buying books for adults. They're buying all this very popular genre fiction. So I think it's that. I think it's that. So either connecting it better to schools and finding a way, some way of appealing directly to, to young people. I mean, this, and there's something that Fatima said when I interviewed her for my thesis is that, the things that mark out this particular period of your life are exactly the things you're not allowed to talk about, especially when it's the school that's buying. So I think that, that that's, you know, all these different things get into, enter into it. Right, and I, uh, when you say uh, genre, it's horror, uh, yeah. romance. Horror, um, police, sort of like detective fiction, romance for sure, yeah. So we have a question from Anoha Forster. Uh, by playing with language, did this take you into writing in Ameya? Do you think we should write toddler books in Ameya? And how, what do you think about the language used for YA? Uh, is this uh, for me? OK. Um, OK, the Ameya issue is 100 years old. <laughs> Uh, when I first started writing, I wrote my first four books in Amiya, but nobody published them for me. So I translated them to Fusha and I published them. And my theory was uh, children under six years old, their mother tongue is Amiya. So why do we have to write in Fusha and then let the reader translate it to the child? I mean, there's no mother who reads the Fusha to the children. They translate it to Arabic, to, uh, sorry, to uh, Amiya. Uh, so my theory was that we should do that, but then nobody uh, accepted to translate, to publish in Amiya. Uh, 
That's why I created a very simplistic language in Fusha that's very close to Amiya. Let's say if there is the word uh, uh, Qafaza means jump and Natta means jump. So the child uses Natta, I'm going to use Natta. Same thing with Basa to kiss. It's Qabbala Basa. Basa is in the dictionary, so I will use that. Um, so uh, lately I self-published, since no one <laughs> ever accepted to publish in Amiya, uh, I self-published uh, a book uh, a couple of months ago. It's called Ars Bladi, and it's about the, the revolution we're having here in Lebanon. Uh, it's an Amiya, and uh, unfortunately it came at the right, wrong time. You know, we're locked down, we have, you know, all kinds of uh, crises in Lebanon. Um, so it's not, uh, I mean, it's in some bookstores, but I haven't had the chance to tour it into schools or, uh, and that's another problem. Schools will, will not uh, order it uh, and let their children have it, even preschool, because it's an Amiya. So it's a big issue and I, uh, I, if I had the money that um, Yasmin is offering, <laughs> I, will, <laughs> I will publish. Uh, I have a long list of uh, toddler books that I have written, two series, I think, each of five books in Amiya. And they're sitting in one file in my computer and they're waiting for, you know, for the right moment uh, to be published. So I really want to do that. Um, and we'll see if it will happen one day. <laughs> Hopefully. So uh, I just have a reminder from the from Ruth to explain very briefly that Amiya is a, a spoken uh, Arabic that differs from country to country, region to region, and Fusha is sort of a shared Arabic. Although um, I um, learned from from Suzanne's PhD thesis that um, that students can be very sensitive to this as well, and that um, sometimes there is an over interpretation of something as Ania as um, when it is actually for Yeah, can I say something? Okay, <clears throat> I agree with uh, Fatma that this is a problem, especially with schools, so they refuse anything that has Ania. And I face the same thing with my uh, novels, the young adult novels, although I have some dialogue in, uh, it's not all in Ania, but some dialogue is in, uh, in Ania, I use that. And uh, I got questioned about that by schools and uh, and also uh, like Fatma, I try to use very simple, straightforward language so that it will be appealing to the age group, even to the young adult uh, group who, who don't really like to read the long stories. Um, so I had to, some of them would say, why is your book in Amir? It's They would think that all the novel is in Amir, whereas it was just like, two, three sentences in a chapter. Uh, so uh, it's, still, it's still a problem, but uh, right now, there are many publishers who are, there are two actually uh, in Egypt, one is an Egyptian Rehan in, uh, in the US who have already published books and uh, in Amiya and uh, taken that step. And uh, they seem to have uh, gotten some success of course, they were attacked by a lot of, uh, you know, people who uh, really, really resent that. But uh, my personal opinion as a writer and as a publisher is that uh, it's uh, another kind of diversity and another kind of choice for kids. Why not? Why not help both? If parents like, uh, would like to buy uh, Mia, it's like saying, only eat vegetables, don't eat uh, chocolate or ice cream or cake because that's uh, not good for you. And uh, with books, it's the same. You can get an Amiya book if that uh, gives you pleasure or uh, one in classical therapy. Can I add something? Uh, the problem with Amiya is Amiya in Lebanon is not the Amiya of Morocco, it's not the Amiya of uh, Egypt. So that's one, one issue, whereas the classical Arabic will be distributed in all of the Arab 22 Arab, Arab countries and it will be understood. Another problem is uh, even if I'm writing in Lebanon for the Lebanese, my dialect in Beirut is totally different from Hasbaya, where are you from Hasbaya, Suzanne? <laughs> 
from the sub, you know. Uh, so how do you write a word that is uh, sometimes uh, the the alif is pronounced uh, o or a uh, or e? And it depends. Uh, some uh, in some towns they uh, pronounce the kaf. In other towns they don't. They don't. So there is no one unified way. Uh, do you only write in sounds that you hear? Or if you want yeah. to write minha, you are minna, or just minha, you add the ha. So it, that's why I think that's a that's more of an issue than of just writing uh, amia. I yeah. think so there's not there, one. There has been uh, like uh, this experiment that's been done. Uh, uh, publisher, the publisher she published the, the same book in different dialects. Like it's the same book in Egyptian in uh, Lebanese, in Jolibet, that's too much really. And yeah. I agree, I had the same experience when we, when I had to transcribe the uh, uh, Hazish, which are the Arabic nursery rhymes written already or uh, sung in uh, uh, colloquial. And I had to make my own rules. Should I say ah, or should I write this word as uh, in classical and the other one? Uh, and then, you know, uh, I agree with you, Fatma, it's not, it's not easy. I think we have time for one more question. So I would like to take a question from uh, somebody who hasn't been heard from yet. Mira Amin, she says, how do you as a writer manage maneuvering around taboo issues given what's considered controversial? How do you reinforce healthy ideas about things such as relationships or love as Hadil mentioned? But I'd like to take it first to Fatima because she wrote about, for instance, a relationship. she's written about relationships in her. Yes. yes. But uh, as Tagarit uh, said, we self-censor our, uh, ourselves uh, our, as writers. The thing is, uh, of course, when you write to, for, for young adults, you have to write about issues they live, about love, relationship, changes in the body. Uh, I mean, we hesitate a hundred times before writing about a girl who has her period in the classroom, let's say, and the blood is on the, car, on the, on the chair. You don't, whereas they read about these things in, in foreign languages, the same kids, the parents allow them to read whatever they want in English or French. Yes. But if you write the same thing in Arabic, okay, it's not allowed <laughs> because of an Arab, because an Arab person is writing it in the Arabic language. Uh, also about, um, not only about sexual issues or relationships, um, revolting against power, you know, political issues. We, we really have, we are oppressed in our countries and we, we can't express ourselves freely in many, many um, issues. So uh, uh, how do I end it? Uh, like in, with Fatan, there's a love story and the best they could do in the car, he puts his hand on her lap. <laughs> um, and Cappuccino, um, uh, I had an interview with the students a couple of days ago in Dubai, and he, um, he asked me, um, are they lovers, Anas and Lina? And I said, I wish they, I, I made them best friends, but I didn't go, go once to make them lovers because then I, did, I wanted to go, you know, all the way and I couldn't uh, because the book has in all of the Arab countries, so I didn't. So some, you don't, sometimes you just put it behind your back and uh, let the reader imagine <laughs> what they want to imagine. But I hope one day uh, we can break all these taboos and talk about teenage pregnancy, about uh, drug abuse, you know, about uh, revolting against uh, the leaders that are corrupt. We have to deal with these issues one day. Thank you so much. And I must say, I did imagine, I sort of imagine remembering that there was a kiss in Fatin, but I know there really wasn't. But so the last question is somebody wants to know how to stay, I know time's up, um, but uh, somebody wants to know how to stay connected with the speakers. So um, I will try to put Hadil, uh, Fatima have websites, uh, Tagrid, we can uh, link to um, uh, Salwa books. Suzanne, you can tell me how you might like people to be able to be in touch with you and we'll have- On Twitter? Hmm? On Twitter? Oh, yeah, on we can, we can add Suzanne's Twitter handle. So I'm sorry, but Mohini tells me the time is finished. 
So thank you everybody so much for coming. This was fantastic. Uh, and you can find it all on YouTube very soon. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Marsha. Thanks a lot. Thank you.